I don't think I'm in camera. So do you want to do the introductions? Hi, everybody. I'm Judy okay. Kirk. And this is Sarah Rosencrantz. Uh, forgive the technical delays and also my out of breath uh, composure because I had to run up steps to jump into Sarah's <laughs> Zoom. Uh, Sarah is hosting me <laughs> in more than one way. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the Stevens Essay Collection, which is an important collection here at uh, IU Ma, the Indiana University Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Uh, Sarah, do you want to do the acknowledgement? Uh, yes. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that IU and IU Ma is on the traditional homelands of the Shawnee, Miami, Potawatomi, and Delaware people. Um, and they have a fascinating history and culture that still influences the region today. Um, so if you're in the area, I encourage you to look them up. And if you're not in Indiana, I encourage you to find what native peoples are connected to your land. Um, and before Judy gets started on her fantastic presentation, um, if this is your first Coffee and Curators um, event, I just want to let you know it's going to be a 10 minute talk followed by a 10 minute Q&A. So if you have questions as we go on, just put them in the chat and we will read them off at the end for Judy to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're off to a spectacular start due to my <laughs> technical insufficiencies. But I do want to, again, um, be, welcome you to this Coffee and Curators. Um, it's um, an opportunity to go through and talk a little bit about the different collections that we have and the research, the study, the uh, programs that we're doing with collections. And I'll be speaking about the Stevens Essay Collection. I'll just share my screen here. Okay, um, I should note that the Stevens Essay Collection. Yeah. Sorry, we're having another technical question. You think it's me? <laughs> uh, Sarah is discovering that I'm ruining our technology as well. <laughs> there it is. That way. There you go. Yep. The uh, gentleman that you see pictured before you here is W. W. Stevens, Warder W. Stevens, uh, who plays a central role in this collection development. Uh, Stevens was born in Kentucky, but moved into Indiana and uh, settled around Washington County uh, and was a figure in Salem, uh, Indiana. And this is of course, in the uh, mid 19th century, uh, this is a gentleman who rose to civic prominence in his, in his community. Uh, and he is a gentleman who um, wrote the centennial for Washington County, uh, one uh, publication that's still referenced today in the community and elsewhere. He was very interested, apparently, of course, in the heritage of his community and in the state and also generally the Midwest as well. Uh, and he began to acquire materials over a period of decades, materials that were reflective of an earlier part of the state's history, its sort of settlement area uh, era. And um, but he, he also collected materials associated with the uh, uh, indigenous peoples. Um, he was collecting arrowheads, that is projectile points, he was collecting banner stones, uh, and he amassed quite a few of those as well. Uh, so he was seeking primarily to document what he would refer to as pioneer life, that is the settlement of uh, European Americans into the community, but he recognized that there were, of course, the peoples that came before. Um, Warder met up with a gentleman named Logan Esseray. Um, towards the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And Logan Essere himself, uh, an Indiana boy, was uh, also very interested in the heritage of the state. He was interested in 
um, material culture of the state. Um, and he was interested in teaching about the history of Indiana. Uh, it's not as if there weren't history classes about the state being taught. It's just that there was a kind of haphazard approach to it. And Esri himself taught what some people still think of as the first real structured uh, course on Indiana history at Indiana University. Um, he became actually an editor of the Indiana Magazine of History. And um, becoming acquainted with W. W. Stevens and his collection, he urged the university to acquire that collection. Uh, and in fact, the university did purchase it. And SRA became a sort of de facto curator for it. There was not a history museum. There was not any sort of official institutional um, res repository for that collection. But more or less, uh, SRA took responsibility for it and sort of took control of it. He did um, actually invite Stevens to describe the collection a bit in the Indiana Magazine of History. This is a uh, just a selection, an excerpt from the article that Stevens wrote in 1914 that does give a kind of overview of the collection. And the introduction to it is by the editor, of course, Logan Essere, who talks about the relics of this collection, the pioneer activity it represents, uh, the kind of materials, the, the quote unquote Conestoga wagon, plows, uh, various types of plows, uh, materials associated with textile um, and cottage industries, materials associated with food and food preparation, agriculture, animal husbandry, so on and so forth. It's quite a range. And, and to be honest, uh, it's fairly comprehensive in the sense that it does hit upon a number of different absolutely essential activities for settlement of this area. Um, and it's a collection we probably could not, from this point on, gather together in one place as Stevens and Essere were able to do. One of the things that's interesting about this article, and I'll provide links to it later uh, uh, that I can send to the participants, it's available freely from the Indiana Magazine uh, of History via ScholarWorks at IU. Uh, one of the things is that there's a lot of emphasis by Stevens about the importance of certain kinds of objects. And he, in particular, waxes poetically about the importance of plows, uh, which indeed have an importance if you're trying to understand settlement patterns, if you're trying to understand migration, if you're trying to understand land use and agriculture, the shape, the form, the, the use of the plow has a direct impact on success in agriculture. Um, there's also um, uh, use of these objects in various ways, uh, not just in discussion and in publication, but you start to see um, the t objects kind of popping up here and there. Again, there's no official museum, but the university or people associated with the university are beginning to recognize the kind of treasure that the collection is, and they start um, utilizing elements of it. Uh, there's references to showcasing the certain objects in various fairs and festivals. There's IDS articles, there's IU alumni quarterly articles, and so on and so forth, talking about um, this collection from Indiana University and the historical materials associated with it being on display here or being on display in another place. Unfortunately, the documentation is kind of um, uneven, so we don't have a really good handle on exactly what might have been presented, or it, indeed if these were coming from the Stevens now SRA collection, but it's likely that some would. Uh, SRA himself writes an important work. Uh, it's the Indiana Home, which is published actually shortly after his death, and in this work that has a lot of influence to the state and is certainly cherished by a lot of people in terms of how it describes the settlement area and again the, the carving out of a space in this new place. Um, there are lovely illustrations, not by Esri himself, but by another gentleman, although it's hard to look at these illustrations and see the objects and not assume that there was definitely inspiration, if not in some tapes, 
literally uh, figurative drawing. Um, another thing that we see later is the sort of documentation of certain kinds of objects, um, an attempt to record numerically objects, and that has an impact later on the museums that do sort of assume control and responsibility for it. This, by the way, um, cowbell, because we all need more cowbell. This, <laughs> that was for Sarah. <laughs> uh, this particular piece is indeed the very first accessioned object in the collection. At least it's been given the first accession number. That's how museums are tracking through. This is 30, a generic year given to record the transaction. And this is uh, the first accession of the this Stevens Essary holding. Now, what's interesting about the um, materials is not only do we start to see evidence of the materials showing up in, again, sort of records keeping, but certainly we see the use of materials in these later museums. Um, this is a particular uh, good example of the range of the materials. This is actually an exhibit called Pioneering Indiana. It was the second large museum exhibit at the Mathers Museum in 1985. You can see all sorts of materials, the, a buck saw to the right, uh, the axe, the broad axe, uh, and of course a horse. This is a device in the very forefront of the of photograph. A horse would be that is a Cooper's horse used to hold something in place as you shaved it or shaped it. One would place uh, your foot on the lower sort of brake like uh, object and press down so that the lever would hold whatever you needed to be held in place. Um, there's also um, a more recent kind of exhibition of these materials that um, reflect newer technologies than the traditional exhibition space work. This is a this is truly a classroom experiment. This is a 3D modeling of some of the Stevens SRA materials. The 3D modeling itself allows you to go in and of course manipulate, twist and turn the particular object to get a better sight and view of it. I'm going to share um, I don't know if I should actually. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. I'm going to share a link to that. Uh, we can take a look at get out of this. We can take a look at what it actually looks like as we manipulate it. I think you're still sharing. I am. Yeah. I'm trying to get out of this to share. Trying to get to the meeting controls. Oh, they're up at the top of that screen. Yeah. Let's go to this. Okay, use this again. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. This is actually a sketch fab and it is a um, somewhat free modeling presentation um, software application. Again, these is, this is just a small sampling of some of these objects. Um, but if we sort of load up one of the models, what's really nice about this is these are annotated artifacts. Um, we can first hide the annotations um, so that we can get a, a you know, kind of a, an overview of it, but we can also go in and look at the information associated with the particular um, aspect of this object. Um, we can also go back and look at another object here, like for instance, the hackles or hedgels. This was used for combing of flax, uh, which is important stuff if making linen. 
again, we can hide, we can twist, we can take a look at some of the wonderful use uh, and design, right? Now, is 3D modeling and rendering perfect? No, but it does give us a, another way, another kind of texture or flavor to actually examining the objects themselves. So let me go back. In a few minutes. Yeah. If you scroll right. over. Right. I'm trying to get that thing over there. <laughs> oh, you go all the way that way. Okay, one um, last sort of group of slides associated with this particular collection. Um, certainly we have some exhibits that um, reflect instruction and education. Uh, this was early 50s, and it was again another kind of proto-museum. Um, and there was a lot of emphasis on the Indiana heritage of the institution. Um, there's also more recent exhibition uh, featuring our own Sarah John Catcher leading a recent tour. This exhibit didn't focus on heritage education or on the uh, sort of settlement area per se, really focused on another example of this wagon as transportation uh, and travel and conveyance. Uh, and it was used as a kind of comparative object, which is a, an important role for these historical materials. And then beyond exhibition, interpretation, programming, research and study, as well as kind of uh, laboratory uses in a way, have uh, been a part of how the Stevens SRA collection has sort of been adapted to contemporary times. These are students from informatics who took advantage of the fact that the wagon itself was pulled apart briefly as storage uh, necessitated. So they were able to sort of take independent uh, objects, photographs, parts and pieces of the wagon, and then um, use that as a way of sort of examining the individual aspects of it and how it all fit together. A kind of interesting approach um, to the wagon itself. And then the last thing I did it on is that this is another element of this uh, collection, the Howe automobile. It is in fact quite an outlier, but it has been incorporated into the collection. Uh, unlikely that it was collected by Stevens it might have been brought into the collection by SRA, but it does kind of reflect a transitional phase of the kind of pioneer era into a more innovative uh, 20th century development. What's nice about this piece is that um, with all the stories behind it, having access to that information is something that a lot of people are interested in doing. And if you go to our website and click on the exhibits link, you can go to a past exhibit link that takes you to a virtual reality uh, Matterport presentation 
that will allow you not only to look at this in more detail, but to watch a, a lovely film that shows a replica of this particular um, early automobile um, being um, sort of presented at a public event here in Bloomington just a few years ago. So from the early stages of the pioneer era to um, aspects of the collection being used to sort of replicate, uh, be replicated for contemporary study and innovation, uh, the Stevens Essary Collection has continued to be an important part of the museums and the heritage of Indiana University. And at the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, uh, will continue to be so as we recognize and value all range of materials that reflect the material culture of humanity and, and really the creativity and spirit of humans who are adapting to new environments and figuring out how to solve basic problems that all of us have. So if any of you have any questions, I'd be very happy to uh, respond in the, the very, very short time that we have. Is there one in the chat? Oh. Oh, no. Thank you, Kelsey, for <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Judy, I do have a question. Um, why did you choose this collection? I chose this collection because it was one of the very first collections I became familiar with when I was a practicum student at the Matters Museum. I walked into the building for the first time and I was shown the wagon. So you can see why it permeates <laughs> through the PowerPoint presentation itself. I, I've got a question for you. Um, when, uh, when in the early thought talks of what the new museum was going to be, uh, there was talk about a big Indiana gallery and the, many of these aspects would be uh, a part of it, including the log house and, and all of that sort of thing at some point. Uh, how will this collection uh, be represented in the, in the new, uh, new exhibits that are going to be opening up? I'd love to hear about that. Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that the uh, collection has always been integrated into many of our exhibits. Again, it has sort of a, examples of comparative materials and material use. Um, we have a wide range of exhibitions coming up um, for the opening in 2023. Five to six exhibits will be opening, and there will be elements um, of the Stevens Essary collection throughout the exhibition, pr primarily in a sort of visible storage presentation, um, which will not focus on the Stevens Essary collection itself, but will feature artifacts from Stevens Essary scattered through a number of different um, exhibits that look at things like food or look at there's a lot in tools oh well that's a good example yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes one of the visible storage uh, presentations will be on tools so again everything from uh, banner stones again mm -hmm. to tools used in uh, sort of uh, crafting sanding preparing um, a settlement space for a new state. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a follow-up question if you have time to Mr. Sure, Terry's question. Yeah, I'd be glad okay? to answer it, Terry. Oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure there was time. I just want to—I want to understand because uh, I think most of the people on this program are probably more uh, knowledgeable than I am about the museum and its new form and all. But I'm interested just to follow up. I want to make understood Mr. K's question about the Indiana focus in the the gallery, the spaces within the new museum itself, mm -hmm. the permanent attention, and how the naming of the existing collections, whatever they may be are carried forward. Just, just educate me a little bit in how the, 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 
what was black and Mather and, and some of these, like how this goes forward and is, is um, identified. In, well, for in instance, the, the collections held by the previous Mathers Museum will be referred to as the Mathers Ethnographic Collections. So the Mathers um, name, the nomenclature will be attached to those materials. Um, in terms of Glenn Black, the uh, archaeology lab, uh, the focus on research will be associated with the Glenn Black heritage and Glenn Black legacy. Now, it's also important to understand that when we talk about Indiana, uh, we are talking about the wide range of human association with Indiana. So our principal exhibition as we open will be focused on Angel Mounds. We'll be looking at the indigenous Good. peoples of of this area of the world Good. and exploring primarily the Mississippian culture mm -hmm. running from about 1050 to 1450. So, um, you know, we will, again, I imagine always have some aspect of Indiana featured in one or more of our exhibitions, but whether we're drawing from ethnographic or archaeological or are both collections at the same time, because truly in the upcoming exhibits, they're fairly integrated. Um, I, I think Indiana will always have a presence, but of course we do have uh, ethnographic objects materials from all over the world, uh, which help us to understand not only um, other peoples of the world, or at least have some um, opportunities to learn about certain aspects of different cultures, but also to sort of make connections between uh, connections between cultures and traditions and what may be shared, what may be very different, and how that's reflective of perhaps environment, right? Uh, or just availability of resources. Thank you. I might, I might add a little bit to that. Um, and Terry, my name's Ed Herman. I'm the, I'm the director of the museum. One of the, one of the aspects that is a whole new concept for us is the way the museum is designed and the idea is as an inside out museum. And what we mean by this is areas of the museum that were typically off limits in most museums. Think about things like um, photography studio, 3D scanning, material science laboratory, the shop where we build sets. These are all areas, including um, the areas where we actually store our collections that are all going to be on on display. These are going to be visible to people. And the idea behind this inside out museum is to bring more people from the outside in, right? And we get more people interested in the collections and in everything we do. So the research that we do is now going to be also visible to people. Um, the analytical laboratories that we use where maybe we're doing bagging and tagging on, on objects. Um, all of that is going to be out for people to be able to engage with and to think about. So our goal with this is to have a larger number of people um, not only interested in our collections, but working on them, doing research on them. Um, and this is the type of thing that will be really important uh, as we as we move forward in trying to bring more people uh, into the museum. A second part of that is we've created um, a lot of spaces for open storage or visible storage where some of these collections, we might not have a big, extremely well interpreted exhibit, but it'll be people will have an opportunity to see some of the items that we have that will be in some cases part of the bigger exhibits that we have on and in other cases might be part of research that people are, are currently working on and therefore we have these objects um, out and, and ready to be, to be used by, by the researchers or students. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome. Um, if there are no more questions, we might go ahead and wrap up since we went a little long with some technical difficulties. Um, but Judy, you did fantastic. It was amazing. <laughs> you overcame. Um, and for all of y'all joining us, we Coffees and Curators is a monthly program. So please stop by like 
every month. Um, and our next one is going to be on May 12th. And Kelsey is our fantastic archivist and librarian. And she's going to talk about um, the 1939 Angels Mounds documents and objects. Right. So, yeah, please join us. <laughs> Thanks again.